Thank you. Um, so many distinguished uh, guests and uh, my old colleagues, former Premier Chok Tong, Ministers George Jo, CEO Indra Nui, the old friends uh, here. I'm delighted to be back. And um, such a difference because um, I've not been served lunch yet. And they tend to forget the fact that uh, when I was in prison, I was never served proper lunch. <laughs> and one of the conditions I impose to all my hosts is that serve me proper lunch <laughs> to compensate for the loss for the many years. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, and I must commend the organizers for continuing the Singapore Summit. For us in Malaysia, and, and I believe for the region, this is a, an important opportunity for us to reflect and see the direction of not only our countries, but our economies. Malaysia has observed, seen a phenomenal change on May 9th. I can't claim credit because I was in prison resting. This was to Mahade, Aziza, and other colleagues worked very hard. And the step was unprecedented. Defying the predictions of pundits and political analysts alike, including those in Singapore, they voted into power the Pakatan Harapan coalition, both at the national level and the provinces. The traditional strongholds of the incumbent power fell like dominoes. There was no doubt there was a nationwide tsunami. The elections in 20, 2008 and to 2013 was duped by the then Prime Minister as a Chinese tsunami. But this, this year's election was, as I said, unprecedented because you are able to garner support from all races, all regions in the country. Cutting across ethnic, cultural, religious, and geographical boundaries, spoke in one clear voice, we want change. Enough of corruption, enough of racism. In then, with the government that holds out the promise for real accountability, I use the word, the term, democratic accountability, because craving for democracy without proper accountability through a free media, judicial independence is not complete. I see this again with great circumspection. Holding out the promise is a pledge. It is a sacrosanct declaration of intent, which of course must be tested by deed and not by pronouncements, slogans, or slip service. Its success will be marked by the implementation of programs and initiatives by the people for the people. We embark on this bold journey at a time when fascism is coming into vogue and democracy is under duress around the world, more so in Muslim countries and Muslim societies. This is something, therefore, that Asians and Muslims can celebrate as a remarkable and positive development. We have articulated a vision for the nation that is based on the fundamental principles that have been integral to the reform, or what we term as the reformasi movement. Strengthening, strengthening the institutions of governance so that never again will we allow the executive to wield so much power and do so much damage to the, to the nation. Indeed, I must commend Dr. Mahade, because in the first 100 days, some major steps have already been taken. The anti-corruption body, the MACC, heated to answerable only to the Prime Minister, 
is now made accountable to parliament. One of the great failures that we will be paying the price for years to come was that the Anti-Corruption Commission was not able to function independently. The Auditor General's office has also been earmarked to be independent of the executive. This will go very far in ensuring real and effective oversight of Malaysia's financials. We also need to ensure that the judiciary is independent. And I have a clear interest here. And the misconduct by the judges and lawyers carries swift and significant consequences. Judges must be insulated from political interferences. Our best efforts at reforming the system can come to naught if deficiencies in the international architecture of capital are not addressed. The one MDB debacle provides us with ample reason to be concerned that these reforms are not taking place. Billions of dollars were siphoned off across the global network of enablers of money laundering and grand theft. I must commend some authorities, including the Department of Justice of the United States of America, giving us the support in the investigations to be able to at least secure some of this money squandered from the nation. This tells us that there is no room for complacency even in the world's most advanced economies and financial systems when it comes to strengthening governance. The importance of a free media cannot be overstated. Although we, I mean, have shared this with uh, former Prime Minister Chok Tong, that uh, a free media sounds nice to most people, but to, for those who are in power, it's not something that uh, we well cherish. But it will take discipline, tolerance, and the commitment to be able to support this initiative because it is an, an antidote, the most effective antidote to their arrogance of power. Almost overnight, the mainstream media in Malaysia took its first breath of freedom on the evening of elections. The media is certainly free now to report the truth, to interpret the truth, or to debunk some of the what was considered, at least, sacrosanct in our countries. But the vestiges of political and corporate influence in media still remain. And unless those issues of governance and accountability are addressed, then the credibility of the media in an era of fake news would remain suspect. To suggest that our government has in Inherited a fiscal mess would be an understatement. As we entered the ministries and started taking control of the reins of power, we are learning the full extent of how the previous administration mismanaged the country. I would go as far as saying this was a case of criminal financial management. Notwithstanding, we have had accolades from analysts, from rating agencies. But now when we go through the accounts, it's horrendous crimes committed at the expense of the country and the masses. Fortunately, we still have strong macroeconomic fundamentals. Prime Minister Mahade has taken some dramatic steps towards reining in spending, not too popular, but necessary to consolidate our position and to ensure that the economy remains stable. In the short term, this is critical. But I do not believe the fiscal scenario is at all in dire straits. 
Sound management will get us back on solid footing so that the economy can go beyond just threading water. Looking to the future, mere wishful thinking will not get us back to the status of an Asian tiger. A lot would have to happen between now and then to make that dream a reality. Rooting out corruption is an integral part of the strategy, but that alone is not enough. A bucket would imply, would simply, if you pluck the holes in it. We have to find new ways of stimulating growth, stimulating growth and revenue in the economy through efficiency, innovation, and creativity, and making sure that Malaysia continues or becomes an attractive destination for foreign direct investments. As a person who has some limited influence in managing the economy in the past, I would certainly admit the fact that Malaysia would not be able to achieve that status without its pro-market policies and ensuring that the country remains attractive for foreign investments. We have to deal with our bureaucracy, which is clearly bloated, taking on a life and purpose of its own, barely resembling the function for which it was initially intended. I concede that this is a delicate process in a period where there is mounting unemployment. In the election manifesto, education was given a priority. A strong education system is the engine for the future indigenous growth. Serial mismanagement of the education system has led to a chronic problem of mediocre teaching in the absence of a strategy, strategy on how to prepare for the next generation of competent leaders. The unemployment and underemployment rate among the graduates is one of the factors that contributed to the strong support we have from younger Malaysians. We need to attract the best educators to come back to Malaysia to teach, and we need to give our best and brightest students a good reason not to seek better educational opportunities abroad. This has some bearing on the obsolete, what I consider as an obsolete new economic policy that is race-based. In 2007, I articulated very controversial proposal to depart from that strategy which became so sacrosanct sacrosanct among the Malays, the new economic policy. It has its um, rationale to give confidence and security to the majority of the Malays, relatively poorer, but I think we have to pass that. It is now considered absolute, obsolete because whilst propelling economy upwards, I do not necessarily ignore the importance of affirmative action based on need. The marginalised, the poor, majority are still Malays and indigenous people, the Chinese in the urban squatters, the Indians and the estates, the Kazan, Kadazans and Ibans in Sabah and Sarawak, these issues must be addressed. So meritocracy has its basis and must be supported, but affirmative action policies that would cater for the plight of the underprivileged, the poor and the marginalised must be continued but it must be need-based and not race-based. Now, the other concern about Malaysian economy is the cosy relationship between the public and the private sector. We tend to be criticised because from privatisation, we are now 
seen to be re-nationalizing. We must recognize that state intervention is fraught with risks and prone to abuse. Hence, transparency and accountability must remain the touchstones of economic governance, lest we revert to a time when taxpayer money is regularly used to bail out well-connected companies. The government, therefore, must have a role in playing, uh, to play in shaping markets and addressing externalities. But we cannot ignore that too much influence will distort markets and prevent us from creating incentives that stimulate innovation and risk-taking. The e economy must cut free from the growing power of government favoritism, corporate monopolies, and the regulations that shut small business and entrepreneurs out of the game. All the while, our new government must remain faithful to the pledge of ensuring distributive justice while promoting economic growth. Again, I reiterate, the need for affirmative action should be directed towards the needy, all of them, irrespective of race and religion. Only then can Malaysia be seen as a just nation that is equally committed to the development of all our people. We must therefore be very vigilant against the sign, any sign of slouching towards perverse patronage that in the past created a breeding ground of rent seekers. Moral hazard must remain a vocabulary of history. Going forward, we need healthy competition, free but fair trade, and a new and resilient social safety net that considers the needs of all citizens. We are, of course, confronting turbulent times. Some consider this post-truth, which I find great difficulty in understanding, but certainly it is post-normal. My political leadership, the economic turbulence, IT revolution, it is quite difficult to anticipate all developments and events. Assumptions about how the world works are falling to pieces and more sinister, sinister ideologies are taking root and spreading. Pessimism about the current order is on the rise. I remember quoting Herman Kahn in the 70s that politics, I don't know why I'm, I enter politics despite his statement, uncharismatic and low moral profession. <laughs> I don't have to tell you about business. I'm confined myself to politics. <laughs> Just 36% of Germans, 24% of Canadians, and 9% of the French thought that the next generation would be better off than their parents. In America, the figure holds at 37%. This sentiment has contributed to the rise of ultra-nationalist ideologies and the resurgence of authoritarianism around the world as people lose, face in the, lose faith in the status quo. I'm still trying to organize myself. In prison, I only speak Malay. <laughs> so, George, you may be surprised that my pronunciation has declined. <laughs> the status quo is what was, was promised by the spread of democracy, free markets, global trade and technology, greater peace and prosperity to all. But as large swatches of people start to feel betrayed by that promise, those institutions upon which it is built and reinforced have not put forth an adequate response other than more of the same. Political philosophies cannot survive solely on the glory of their past achievement unless there is a renewal of oath and progress towards a better future, they will die. We cannot assume, therefore, that the tremendous success of the last century in which hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty around the world, will be enough 
of a track record to carry us forth into the next hundred years. It's often repeated by Stiglitz and others, the United States, once the beacon of democracy around the world, is rapidly submitting to the dictates of what considered a fringe element, but now represents a solid 35% of the population. To satisfy that segment, nativists, anti-immigrant, anti-trade policies are being implemented at breakneck speed. All societies go through a cycle of birth and rebirth, which is why ASEAN nations must also anticipate a future that is not simply a linear projection of its past successes and failures. At a time when the whole world is undergoing a realignment, ASEAN nations could forge a new path that strengthens our collective ties through collaboration on infrastructure, infrastructure development and realization of the ASEAN market connectivity plan, which would strengthen collaboration among our regional, regional grouping to address the need for new infrastructure, a more friendly regulatory environment for innovation and investment, and overall integration in trade, travel, and logistics. We believe, therefore, that there is a tremendous untapped potential in the economy, and we will do everything that we can promote to do, that we can to promote growth. We have to improve the investment climate for foreign direct investments and look for ways to make the doing of business in Malaysia much easier. We are also looking to make new inroads into trading relationship that offer untapped potential across South Asia and Far East and to reassure our colleagues in Singapore that includes Singapore very much so and China. Going forward, I have great optimism that we can transform Malaysia into a new economic force in the region with vibrant pro-growth policies and a stable and clean business environment where the rule of law prevails and democratic institutions are firmly in place, I believe, inshallah, God willing, Malaysia will emerge once again as an exemplary economic power driving progress and development in the region. Terima kasih. Thank you.